Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist in Jackson, Michigan. Thank you for joining us as we walk our way through the process of studying sacred scripture while we take a deep dive into the Old Testament book of Exodus. I'm your host, Todd Gale. Strap yourself in for a long, prayerful trip. Welcome to our 17th episode of Exodus. In our last episode, I looked at a few explanations of the Ten Commandments, one by one, coming from the Catechism, and some of our great history of Catholic commentary. So to start today, if you've not already, we're going to read all of chapter 20 after we pray, the giving of the law and the Ten Commandments. So for the prayer, two great prayers from the great mind of St. Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas' prayer for all good things. Loving God who sees in us nothing that you have not given yourself, make my body healthy and agile, my mind sharp and clear, my heart joyful and contented, my soul faithful and loving, and surround me with a company of men and angels who share my devotion to you. Above all, let me live in your presence, for with you all fear is banished, and there is only harmony and peace. Let every day combine the beauty of spring, the brightness of summer, the abundance of autumn, and the repose of winter. And at the end of my life on earth, grant that I may come to see and to know you in the fullness of your glory. Amen. Prayer Before Study by St. Thomas Aquinas Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, lofty origin of all being, Graciously let a ray of your brilliance penetrate into the darkness of my understanding and take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, an obscurity of both sin and ignorance. Give me a sharp sense of understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to look through this chapter again through the lens of the literal sense and then the spiritual senses. Israel was in Egypt for 400 years, generation after generation of being soaked in the Egyptian country and mindset and religious practices and morality. Like an abused child, they might hate their childhood where they grew up and where they found themselves. And they find themselves later acting the same way. They're unable to change because they know no other way. In Genesis, God was mostly concerned with reproduction, and his covenants thus far have been centered pretty much on being fruitful and multiplying, right? But now he deepens his relationships, and he deepens his expectations with his people. He seems to be more concerned now with morality. The covenant of Sinai further develops the notion of God's family as a nation. This moral code is surprising surprisingly culturally generic. The initial Ten Commandments are not really bound to any customs of Israel. It's not really bound to the customs and the sacrifices and the roles of the priest and the eating restrictions or any of those things. These Ten Commandments are very generic in the sense they're like the natural law for all humanity, unfolded first of all before the people of Israel. These are the rules written on the human heart. They're not ethnic rules of Israel. They're human rules for all of humanity. It's really important to catch that. We're going to take a look at our text commentary in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible on chapter 20, verse 1 through 7 on the Decalogue. The Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, Decalogue meaning the, the Ten Words, It's inscribed on two tablets of stone. We're going to see this in chapter 31. It will explicitly tell us about the stone. 
These laws delineate the two precepts of charity. First, the love of God, commandments 1 through 3, and then the love of neighbor, commandments 4 through 10. The Ten Commandments are the first stage of God's revealed law. Its purpose was to prohibit what is contrary to the love of God and to the love of neighbor. The Catechism says this in 1962, paragraph 1962. The law is holy, it's spiritual, and it's good, but it's still imperfect. It showed humanity what must be done, but it doesn't give the strength or the, the grace of the Spirit to fulfill the law yet. Right? The commandments in the old law are more like the x-ray or the diagnostic test. They show us what's not right. They show us what we do wrong. But the Ten Commandments do not give us the cure or the way of health or the way of holiness. In that way, it's imperfect. Last session, I did sort of an airplane overview of each of the Ten Commandments. So we'll just look at a few things a little bit deeper today. This is Yahweh's divine right to demand obedience from his people. He demands a certain level of kindness and goodness from his people way back then, and he demands a certain level from his people today. Part of that demand is rooted in who God is, the one true God. Everything in these tablets flow from the idea of monotheism. Mono meaning one, Theism meaning things of God, one God. Israel was totally unique in the ancient world and still is very unique in the modern pantheon of gods. The cultures around them, like for example Egypt where they just fled, they all had a god of rain, of the sun, of the earth, of disease and wind and fire and chocolate and football and you name it, they had a god for everything. Israel has one god. And this is how he lays the foundation of the commandments in monotheism. This is super important. Israel is also unique in that they don't have statues and paintings and, and little idols of their God to carry around and bow before. The Lord God wanted it clear. He was not in one little idol. He was not in one location. He is the all in all. The one monotheistic God with no statues, no idols. He's a God of divine love, respect, dignity, and truth. Okay, so the question comes up regarding idol worship and statues. Like, how come today we have pictures of Jesus and we have uh, pictures even of the Trinity? So we're going to look at the, the commentary here in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, 24, the likeness of anything. The coming of Jesus as the true image of God introduces a new economy of worship that transcends the restrictions of the Sinai Covenant. We can look at this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Since the Father has made himself visible in the Son, the believing church can rightly depict his image in visible and artistic ways. Angels and saints can also be rendered iconographically insofar as the image of Christ shines through them. In other words, as icons, graphically and icons, iconographically. The propriety of sacred art and its link with the Incarnation was affirmed by the Second Council of Nicaea in the year 787. If you want to dig into this more, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1159 to 62, and paragraph 21, 29 to 32, those paragraphs of the Catechism talk more about the image of God and the way this plays out today. So today, some Protestants and some Christians will still have an empty cross. They have no corpus, no body, no Jesus on the cross. And some of them even refer to this commandment. This is why, because they said there's to be no image of God, and Jesus is God. Yet, yeah, it's, it's really kind of strange. The same folks who refuse to have a statue of Christ's body on the cross most likely have modern paintings of Jesus in their churches or in their homes. They may have a nativity set with baby Jesus. They probably have picture books and Bibles with illustrations of Jesus. So to say that they have a cross without the corpus for the reason of this commandment, it's not really thought through very well. 
One of the reasons Catholics, Orthodox, and even many Lutherans do have a crucifix, the cross with the body of Jesus on it, is because it's deeply rooted in the oldest traditions of the church. In fact, St. Paul has some very interesting words in his letter to the Galatians that makes it sound like maybe there were depictions of crucifixion all the way back in the first centuries of Christianity. So, St. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, Oh, foolish Galatians! you got to love St. Paul. He just gets right to the point. Who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Paul is irked and dismayed that his re readers have succumbed to the pressure of the Judaizers, of those that want to go back to ancient Judaism. They want to go back to the old covenant law. And he's not very happy. He calls them foolish. And he talks about how Christ was portrayed before them. The Galatians didn't witness the crucifixion of Christ in person because Galatia is hundreds of miles north and to the west way north of the Mediterranean Sea, nowhere near Jerusalem. Probably none of those Galatians probably were there at the time of the crucifixion to have seen Jesus personally. But they embraced the message of the cross that, that Paul so vividly proclaimed. He says that Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, displayed before you like a placard or a display or a banner or a poster. Like, it's a really strong way of saying that something is just orally presented. Like, that, that, that was just the words of Paul. It's just the words of evangelization. And, oh, foolish Galatians, right? It seems like he's using really strong words that he seems like he's saying that it's not just an oral presentation of the crucifixion. It really reads like they saw something. Some scholars speculate that already the crucifix was being seen. Some sort of crucifix was displayed. They were actually seen by the eyes of the Galatians all the way back when Paul writes this letter, probably in the 40s or 50s, um, shortly after the crucifixion itself. Isn't that very interesting? Anyway, I chased a rabbit for a bit. Back in Exodus 20, verse 5, it's a little unsettling to me, and maybe to you, that God is a jealous God. I heard once before that Oprah Winfrey heard this preached once in her Baptist church, and that this was the thing that turned her off to a mainline Christianity in favor of sort of a New Age, positive thought kind of system. It was preached and taught either poorly, or she misunderstood it, or maybe a little bit of both. What does it mean that God is jealous? Well, there's a difference between jealousy and envy. When you're jealous of something, you want what belongs to you. God wants you. He, he doesn't want to share us. We belong to him. When he's jealous, God will fight for his people. He will protect them. He'll bring them back to him. Jealousy is really rooted in this sense, in mercy and in, and in deep love. He'll fight for his name and our name in him. Because he is a jealous God. Now, envy is a jealousy that goes way, way overboard. Envy says, if I can't have you for myself, I'll destroy you. I'd rather take you down than share you. That's envy. Jealousy is the love that Jesus has for us. He's so jealous he will die for us. He'll give everything for what's truly his. Envy, on the other hand, is the twisted love that Satan has for God. So envious that if God loves humans more than angels, Satan will destroy humans and even destroy his own relationship with God rather than share the love of the Father. Right? Destroying everything for what really doesn't belong to you in the first place. That's envy. Does that make sense? In English, jealousy can have some kind of positive or some negative connotations. Biblically, we mean it in the sense of the positive. Like God is desirous and protective and mindful of us. I love that definition. God is mindful of us. We're always on his mind. That is just so positive. The negative definition of jealousy that we find in the dictionary is not the way the Bible means it. 
God is not begrudging, suspicious, distrustful, resentful. Those are the words that can be applied to the enemy. He is all that toward God and toward us. But God is a jealous God in the sense of being mindful and protective of what really belongs to him. He's willing to fight for and die for his people. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's a great definition of God's love for us. Then in verse 5, coming off this idea of not worshiping idols and false gods, the Lord says he will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Okay, so this is saying for those fathers who hate the true Lord God and they grow, they grow crooked in their ways, that's what iniquity actually means. Iniquity means to grow crooked, right? For those who hate the real God and worship false gods, there will be generational punishments. That's what it says. Hmm. Well, verse 6 makes it clear that those who do follow the Lord will be blessed for thousands of generations. Now, I don't think either number is meant to be exact. The iniquity from great-grandpa is not automatically and always echoed to the third and fourth generation, and then the fifth generation is free, right? And obviously, good families, a thousand generations of all righteous dudes seems just a little optimistic, right? We see this in the Bible itself. The stories of the southern kings of Judah, they turn from the very best to the very worst, to from awesome to awful, and just one generation after another. And we know really well that when people turn from their wicked ways and they return to the Lord, there will be tremendous blessing and tremendous joy. So how do we take this, this generational curse? Part of it is the reality that as the father goes, so the family goes. Like father, like son. Or the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. The reality is when a parent starts to go far astray, it usually takes a major intervention to get the whole family to turn back around again. Not that God himself is cursing the children and the grandchildren and the great-grands as some sort of wicked punishment, but the reality that it may take generations before they decide to return to the blessings of the Lord. I hope that makes sense. Remember, it, Adam and Eve, they're the first parents, and their sin affected everyone, every single generation to follow, right? But the idea is clear. It's serious stuff to turn away. And we see in Israel's history, they do turn away, and there are tremendous disasters that await them when they do. The ugly cycle of sin, disobedience, falling away, and separation can be repaired and it can be reversed. That's the story of salvation. Amen? That's the story of Jesus. Now, in verse 7, the commandment is that the Lord's name shall never be taken in vain. It it'll, it'll, never is to be said in a meaningless, degrading, unholy way. As a nation, Israel exaggerates this to the point of never saying his name at all, ever just in case it's said in vain or in an unworthy manner. Now the Lord marches through the rest of the Ten Commandments. Then in verse 21 through 26, the Lord gives the very first rules of sacrifice and worship. These are sort of, uh, sort of short and sweet and simple. This sort of little expose of animal sacrifice that's given long before the details of later chapters that's going to talk about the priesthood and the formal types of sacrifice that will be established later. Remember, this is a slow revelation of God through many, many generations. So this, these first rules we read here at the end of chapter 20, these first rules of sacrifice are probably very, very ancient. Most scholars say this is one of the earliest sources of material in all of Exodus. It's placed right here. The altar is to be low and natural. There can be both holocausts, which are total burnings. A holocaust is a total burning where nothing remains. Or there can be ritual meal sacrifices, peace offerings, where some of the animals burned and the meat is shared as a sacrificial, sacred, liturgical meal. Right? 
It's to be made with natural stone and unworked materials and low enough that the priests in their everyday garments are, aren't climbing up and, uh, and being seen somehow indecently, right? There's a good text note here on the altar in, uh, in verse 24 in our study Bible. The altar in every place. The Sinai covenant allows for multiple altars and sites of worship. Later on, the Deuteronomic covenant, the one that's going to be found in Deuteronomy, will restrict a public worship to a single location after Israel secures a peaceful existence in Canaan. This later restriction does not take full effect until Solomon builds the Jerusalem temple. Hence, multiple altars dot the landscape of Israel in the days of Joshua, the judges, and the early monarchy. So, in the beginning, there are multiple altars. In the very beginning, there's not even a set priesthood yet. We're going to see that develop in just a few short chapters, right? In the beginning, there were altars sort of all over. As it starts to develop, as it starts to unfold, God is going to have the sacrifices only taking place in the, the tabernacle, a traveling tent. And even that, though, is going to travel. And then eventually, by the time of Solomon, there will be a permanent temple and a permanent altar for sacrifice. Now, the allegorical sense. As Moses goes up the mountain and comes down with the word and teaches the law, Jesus will go up the mountain in the Gospel of Matthew, and he'll sit down with his word and his teaching and the Beatitudes as the law of the New Covenant. The Old Covenant Ten Commandments are a type and a foreshadow of the New Covenant Eight Beatitudes, where the Ten Commandments give rules and guidelines, borders and guardrails. The Beatitudes give heart and selfless sacrifices for the betterment of others. Right? All of the law points to Jesus in Christianity. The commandments are the basic lowest common denominator for life on earth and life in heaven. Right? Jesus will, of course, sum up the whole law, as the Israelites do for many, many centuries, in the Shema. The Shema is the prayer that means to, to hear, the listening prayer. Hear, O Israel. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. That's the Shema in a nutshell. The written law on tablets of stone are going to point toward the written law on the hearts of believers. The commandments are the word of God, as the scripture as a whole are the word of God, and Jesus himself is the word of God. All of this points to Jesus. There is rich symbol and allegory in the mountain, and in the theophany, and in the power of God. We're going to see those images played out again in, in the New Testament, as these images of the mountain point towards Jesus. Many times on a mountain, transfiguration on a mountain, giving teaching on a mountain, great theophanies on a mountain, the ascension takes place on a mountain, right? Lots of things from the Old Covenant pointing forward. That's the allegorical sense. Then there's the action sense. The action is the moral, the tropological sense. It's what theologians call it. Tropos is a Greek word that means direction or turn or way. Logos is the Greek word for word. So it's the way, turn, direction, the word of. It's words about or study about the proper direction, the proper way, the moral way. Tropological. The Ten Commandments are all about moral action. This is literally a list of what we're supposed to do. So in places like this, the tropological sense, the moral sense, the action sense of Scripture is pretty clear. We just read the list. We do what it, what it tells us to do, right? For most of us regarding the first commandment, we don't usually go to Walmart and buy idols of Egyptian gods. We don't usually set up an altar in our homes and burn incense, you know, to pagan deities. Our idol worship today is different. Some of us do set up a huge screen TV and we sit before it for hours at a time. We give it more attention than we do our families or we do God. Most of us do not burn incense to the idols of the sun gods, but we do burn money for the sake of being entertained and comforted. We don't kill our children in a sacrifice to Molech, 
placing babies literally in the hands of this big heated statue, murdering our firstborns for the sake of appeasing an angry God. We don't do that. But millions and millions of babies have been sacrificed to the God of abortion, placing babies literally in the hands of abortionists for the sake of appeasing our financial or our future life plans. Now, these are not easy things, and I'm not making light of something that's very heavy and can be very dark. But idol worship does exist today. It doesn't look like the same thing it looked like 3,000 years ago, but it surely does exist. And it's serious. It's serious. The action sense for us is very much rolled up in the application and the heaven-bound sense as well, where we have to ask, what do we worship? What do we think we must have and we must need in our lives? What gives us security and pleasure more than the Lord? Where do we spend our time? Where do we spend our money? What's on our mind? What makes us agitated? What makes us desperate when it gets taken away from us? What do we depend on? What do we have faith in? This all really requires some thought. It's worth some time to think about, to ponder, what are the idols in our lives? The moral sense of using God's name in vain, OMG, how many times do we say that in a day, right? I've come across people in life that literally thought the name of Jesus was a swear word. They had no idea who he is. They had no idea this is a real person. Because they never were around anyone who used that name with any kind of honor or respect. They only heard it used as a swear word. Oh my goodness, that just breaks my heart. Probably the most frequently assaulted commandment by Christians is the third commandment to honor the Sabbath. Yikes. Do we, do we really honor it? Do we work on Sundays? Do we cause others to work on Sundays? If you have to work on Sundays, you are permitted to take another day. But the point is, you must take another day to Sabbath, to rest. Do we recreate, which literally means to recreate. Do we recreate ourselves with rest? Actually, God recreates us in our rest, right? Do we hallow that day? Do we make it holy? I once heard that a famous rabbi teaches, a man who works with his mind will Sabbath with his hands, and a man who works with his hands will Sabbath with his mind. So, in other words, if you do a lot of mental work, teaching, thinking, mathematics, stats, engineering, your Sabbath rest might be gardening, cooking, or woodworking. But if you're a carpenter, a landscaper, a chef, or a farmer, your Sabbath may be reading, or doing puzzles, right? And, and Sabbath is really twofold. There is worship and centering on God and community worship and prayer and praise and liturgy and fellowship, which means setting aside time to do holy church things, right? That's number one. But it's also, number two, resting. Stop. Shabbat means to literally cease. Stop. There's a great old legend about St. John the Evangelist, one of our favorites, right? In his old age, he was playing with a pet bird, a partridge, I think I heard. And he's playing with this pet, and one of his disciples complains about how much work the, there is to do. And, you know, St. John, you know, Master, why are you playing? There's so much work. And St. John said, a bowman who always has his arrow at the ready and always has the string of the bow pulled back, he'll soon find that his bow has so much slack and no tension left to shoot the arrow. It is useless. To be at its best, the bow needs to be put at rest in between the arrows. Right? And now, each of the other commandments, we, we need to really spend some time with them. Do we steal? Do we lie? Do we lust? Do we dishonor? Make this study of the commandments a really good examination of conscience. Take them to the Lord in the sacrament of confession. Also, in that last section of chapter 20, with the details of worship and sacrifice, we receive the way to offer worship from God himself. He tells us 
how to worship. He shows us what he expects. We receive it. It's not that we go and we just make up liturgy and worship with what feels good. We receive it from the Lord himself and from the historical church. In our Mass, most of the words said and sung are straight from Scripture and direct from the line of Jewish worship. There's actually a lot of freedom in that, right? We don't have to agonize over what we're supposed to do. We receive the form, we receive the details and the purpose. We have so much freedom, though, in that to not have to worry about the structure, but just engage and just enter into the worship itself knowing that it's what God wants because God gave it to us. So the action sense of the Ten Commandments is really straightforward. It is literally a list of things we should do or not do. Now the application, the anagogical sense. Let's settle here for a little while to apply this. Let's take it to our our heaven-bound journey, right? That's what, to apply it, is we're, we're looking at it in a heavenward sense. So do we just mindlessly follow rules or do we follow the heart of God? Are we following begrudgingly? Remember, as Christians, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're called to live a life that leads to perfection and leads to sainthood. We're meant to be children of the light, sharers of God's nature, brothers and sisters with Christ. Are we doing this with a chip on our shoulder? Are we angrily making fists as we make our way through life because we just have to be good boys and girls? Are we, are we angry about the ten thou shalt nots? Are we making an unhappy list of all the fun that God has taken away from us? Or are we joyfully taking on the rule of Christ because we want to be more and more like him? These commandments in the moral life of Christ are not meant to be restraining. They make us free. This is where we find freedom, to be the people we're created to be. This is where we start to become more and more like Jesus, more and more like the people of God that he created us to be. Now, some of you may know our friend Pedro Tovar. My friend Pedro said, it's like we're living in this cage where, where we're in prison, and we're imprisoned in sin. And Jesus Christ comes. Jesus opens the door. And we're free to leave. We're free to, to live in the freedom of Christ. But the cage door stays open. And many of us return to our cages from time to time. Pope Leo the Great wrote a terrific homily for Christmas morning. It's one that we've mentioned before here, and, and I've quoted it in bulletin articles, and we've been using this prayer a lot. It's a wonderful thought from Pope Leo the Great. He says, Christian, recognize your dignity, and now that you share in God's own nature, do not return to your former base condition by sinning. Remember who is your head, and of whose body you are a member. Never forget that you have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the light of the kingdom of God. In other words, the way my friend Pedro thought about it, don't return to the cage. Amen? Now, the oldest surviving Christian document that we have outside of the New Testament is called the Didache, the teaching, the teaching of the Twelve. It begins by saying, there are two ways, the one of life, and the other of death. But between the two, there is a great difference. Jesus talks about the two paths, the narrow one of Christ and the wide path of destruction. This shows the importance of moral decisions for our salvation. The church talks about the way we learn about the commandments in the moral life, the teaching, the catechesis. It should reveal in all clarity the joy as well as the demands of the way of Christ. Amen? The joy as well as the demands. Law must be understood in the context of covenant, of love relationship, in the eyes of love, and what's best for the other. If people only see rules and regulations, they don't understand the covenant relationship. Can you imagine a world where people actually saw this as so much good for the whole community and that people actually saw this lived out with genuine zeal, 
No lies, no disrespect or violence in words or actions. Imagine a world where God was truly worshipped, completely hallowed on Sundays, only spoken of with the greatest of respect and dignity. Ideally, the people of Israel and the people of the new Israel, the Christian church, if we all lived under these Ten Commandments, we would be living this way now. And if all of us did, all Christians, all Jews, we would have such a profound impact on our world. And for sure we already have. I mean, we already do. The good things of the world owe so much to the Christian Judeo ethic, right? But there's room for so much more. In these crazy times, we're often asking, what can I do? What can the little person do? We can live the life that God gave us. We can live the life he wants us to live. We can live a life within the boundaries of those commandments and live as Jesus lived himself. That's what's going to change the world. And that's going to speak volumes. Again, though, we stress the law and the Ten Commandments given to Israel is just the first step. St. Paul tells us in Romans that the old covenant law can only point out the problem. It can only show the standard that we miss. It can show us the vast difference between what God wants and what we actually do. That Paul himself laments in Romans chapter 7, why do I keep on doing what I don't want to do? I try to do right and sin is right there beside me. What a wretched people are all of us. And Paul goes on to explain that the only way out of sin is by knowing a law, a new law, a law of the Spirit. Right? The only way we change is when we allow God to change our nature to be more like Him. To allow the law of the Spirit of God to work in our lives. When our nature changes and our habits change and our thinking changes and soon our hearts change, then we are the new people of the new covenant who live like Jesus and are worthy of that Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Amen? The law cannot change us. The law cannot save us. The law only shows us where we fail. The next several chapters of Exodus is an expounding of other laws that aren't among the Ten Commandments, but are the laws of the Hebrew community. Here we see the wide chasm of difference between Israel and the pagan nations that surround them, the Canaanites and the Jebusites and all the rest of them. Although we still have a long way away from the perfect love and the mercy of Jesus, we see in these laws of Israel a dignity and a kindness and a compassion that is really unlike most other ancient civilizations. Slavery and servanthood has always existed, and it will probably always exist in a sinful world. But in Israel, we see a slavery that's limited. It allows for freedom. It insists on dignity and even protection of the slaves. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time tearing apart these next chapters um, word for word, line for line, they're pretty straightforward. They say what they say, and they make a little bit of sense all on their own. But I will offer a few words of explanation or commentary, but this will be brief, and we're going to move along quickly until we get to some of the more specific details of Israel's worship and the religious practices. The laws that we're going to look at that follow in the next chapters have a lot in common with the commandments in the famous law of Hammurabi, Remember that from high school and college history or sociology? Then there's the Assyrian law book. There's the Hittite code. There are lots of different things that are similar to the Israeli Ten Commandments in the law. But they also can be contrasted for a lot of things that's very unique in the law of Israel. Which one came first? Which was dependent on the others? Where's the divergence between them? Like, it, all of that is a whole area of study that's been bantered about for centuries by those who study cultures. There's really no clear evidence and no really clear proof. The other codes are mostly concerned with property rights rather than individual persons. The other nations tend to kind of favor the wealthy. They don't really offer protections as much for the poor or the dignity of servants in the way that Israel does. But there's a lot of really great things they have in common. I want to chase a rabbit for just a moment. 
The coat of Hammurabi is preserved on a huge black stone and a steel that's carved from a single four-ton slab of a durable, durable stone. And its, its top is a, is a two and a half foot relief. There's a carving of King Hammurabi, who is the sixth king of Babylon in what is today present-day Iraq. On that statue, Hammurabi stands and he's receiving the law symbolized by a measuring rod and a tape. And, and he's receiving that rod from the seated Babylonian god of justice. The rest of that seven-foot, uh, five-inch monument, is, it's just covered with columns and columns of cuneiform script, the laws. It's believed that Hammurabi lived around like the 1700s B.C., and Moses was probably between 1400 and 1250 BC, some centuries later. So Hammurabi was, was a good three centuries at least before Moses. Well, in the centuries between Hammurabi and Moses, we find the code of the Assyrians. It has many, many similar laws, with lots of emphasis on sexual laws, on adultery, on slander, which, which was really interesting because it shows the other cultures of the world the other cultures recognize some protections needed for women, protections needed for young ladies. And their punishments for crimes were sometimes really brutal compared to other, uh, other codes, these Hittite ones especially. Actually, what we see, we see some explicit, detailed, lengthy laws given in almost all of the ancient cultures. The Egyptians, the ancient peoples who lived in India, all those ancient civilizations, they dealt with property rights and marriage and adoption and rules for warfare, even abortion. The laws of Ur-Namu, a Sumerian law collection from long before the time of Abraham, around 2000 BC and before, these Sumerian laws also talked about false accusations and defamation as well as property and marriage rules. The oldest law codes ever found, of course, are connected with the oldest societies that historians have ever recognized, those in that region of Sumer in the, in the Fertile Crescent, right? But most ancient Sumerian laws deal with bodily injuries and murder. The Amorite codes of Ishnuna include laws about pricing of services and divorce and injuries and assaulting slave girls. One rule of the Assyrians says that a man who has sexual relations with his brother in arms must be castrated. That's interesting. The Code of Hammurabi famously has almost word for word one phrase of justice that we find in the Law of Moses. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Almost the exact same wording. So why this big deal about the law that, that the Lord gives Moses? It seems that truth and justice was revealed to all the, the nations of the ancient world. Why is this unique? Well, first of all, all goodness and beauty flows from the Lord God. So we applaud anything and any time we find genuine law and justice anywhere in the world. Because truth flows from the Creator. Anything good filled with salt and light is from God. Amen? Israeli's law, the, the Israelite law is unique in regard to the absolute monotheism, the total commitment to Yahweh with no idols, no statues, no idol worship. That's very unique to Israel. But most of the nations had a certain degree of morality. Another thing that's unique about Israel, the call to a particular weekly Sabbath is kind of different. There were other cultures that, that practiced holy days and maybe even daily practices, but this seventh day Sabbath appears to be somewhat unique in the world religions. Most of them had moon phases and divisions of days that related to the sun and to the moon. Some scholars have even tried to prove that many ancient cultures had seven day divisions of the moon cycle based on the ancient belief there were seven planets and the seven gods connected to those seven planets with Saturday being the highest of the planet, Saturn, with the god Saturn. But it appears that work from those scholars is a little sloppy. As Egypt and other cultures divided the moon cycles not into seven days, but into three decades, three decades of ten days. 
the seven day period does not really fit into that 30 day moon cycle perfectly. So it appears the Lord gave Israel the cycle for reasons other than the moon. There's something about these seven days, seven. And remember in ancient Israel, the seven, the Shava, is actually the same word for to oath, to oath oneself, to covenant oneself, to seven oneself, seven covenant oath. All those are very, very tied together in the thought of Israel. Israel's law also saw kindness that wasn't seen among the ancients. In Israel, a male person could sell themselves into slavery, what we would think of as like indentured servitude. And they could do it for just a period of time, either to pay off a debt or simply to make enough money to live. In Israel, even a slave has certain minimum rights, and the bonds of brotherhood and ethnicity are not forgotten even if they're a slave. So, take a deep breath, prepare to read all chapters 21 through 23, and even chapter 24. And we'll pick up next time by looking at chapters 21, 22, 23, and we're going to start tearing apart chapter 24 as we look at the worship of ancient Israel. Thank you all so much for being here. I love you so much. I miss you so very much. We end as we always do in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you soon, I hope. Thanks for walking the way through the book of Exodus with the Catholic Community Scripture Study. 